Hey, hello, my name is Blake Ledbetter. I am the CFO of Name and Image Sports Agency. Today we've got a really special guest. His name is Arthur Bryant. Arthur is universally considered the preeminent attorney in Title IX athletics litigation in the United States. He was trial counsel in the very first Title IX athletics litigation case against Temple University, and he has successfully represented uh, more women and men in Title uh, IX litigation than any other lawyer in the country. Today, uh, Arthur is going to sit here and speak with us about um, the interplay between name, image, and likeness and um, how Title IX affects that. So, Arthur, I'm glad to have you here today. Um, can you explain to us a little bit about what name, image, and likeness is? Sure. Um, first, thanks for having me. Name, image, and likeness basically are three things that athletes in school now can get paid for the use of that they couldn't get paid before. Prior to this year, um, an athlete couldn't get paid to endorse a product or to do a tweet or to get his picture um, you know, with some product or her, or her picture because it violated NCAA rules. The NCAA recently changed its rules to eliminate those prohibitions on payment. And so what you have is athletes all throughout the country now getting paid to endorse products, um, to ish send out tweets, to urge people to use products, etc. You have kids going into college being offered thousands, hundreds of thousands, some over a million simply to endorse products and let their name and image and likeness uh, be used to advance corporate interests. Okay, so what about Title IX? Can you explain to us what Title IX is and how it plays into co collegiate athletics? Sure, Title IX is a federal civil rights law that prohibits sex discrimination in all educational institutions that receive federal funds which is basically every college and university in the country. Um, because even if they don't accept direct federal funding, they accept students that have Pell Grants or some other financial aid that goes to the school. And it, it prohibits sex discrimination. It's made a huge difference over the last 49 years. It's, been, it's 49 years old. Um, by opening up graduate schools to women that were closed, opening graduate school graduate um, positions that were closed to women, all sorts of sex discrimination, it's ended. But the place it's most visible is in athletics because athletics is the one area of education where there are separate programs for men and women. And that's allowed and encouraged. And what the law says there is basically, if they're separate and they are, they need to be equal. The programs need to offer equal opportunities, equal athletic financial aid and equal treatment to the men and women in the two different programs. So for NIL, what it means is if the school isn't involved at all in the NIL payments or setup, then it, there's nobody held liable under Title IX because nobody's receiving federal funding that's doing anything. But almost in every circumstance, the schools are involved in the NIL uh, activity. They allow their trademarks to be used. They help set up the programs. They help set up the payments. Anything like that, a coach might do it. A athletic director might do it, you name it. And as soon as the school is involved, then Title IX says men and women have to be treated equally, have to get equal treatment and benefits. So when you read, for example, about some school where each of the football players is getting $500 a month from some company, and none of the women athletes are, that's a straight out, assuming the school is involved in the program at all, that's a straight out Title IX violation. And the school is in very severe danger of a Title IX lawsuit that would be successful. Okay, can you give us any other examples that could lead to Title IX violations with a college? Oh, sure, I mean, they're almost unlimited. So for example, if a coach sets up um, in a, in a meeting with his or with the male athletes, um, with some businessman to get paid, or the um, school arranges for the football team and the men's basketball team to be shown in their uniforms endorsing some product or some booster club's company, uh, booster club member's company, uh, 
and doesn't provide the same opportunities to the men and women, um, the schools invite, risking a serious, um, a serious risk of, of liability. Okay, so would I be correct in saying that Title IX doesn't just affect the, the uh, colleges and universities themselves, but it also affects private companies and private individuals from being able to pay student athletes for their name, image, and likeness if they're using some form of trademark or something from the university? Well, if they, if they are doing anything that involves the university and providing Overall, the school is the one that's responsible for making sure men and women are treated equally. So in theory, some company could fund things only with male athletes, and another company could fund something with only female athletes. And as long as it all proved equal in the end, there's no liability. On the other hand, um, if some company comes forward with the school's cooperation and pays only male athletes, unless um, they're also paying, or, or the school is making sure that women athletes are being paid. They're creating a danger, not only for the school, but for them, that they are conspiring in a violation of Title IX, which would put them in liability. Okay. Uh, before we end here, can you, um, and, and I know we're in uncharted territory now with um, NIL just uh, becoming a thing, really, in collegiate athletics starting July 1st of this year. Um, so with us being in uncharted territory, could you give us maybe two best practices or policies that you would suggest for universities um, involving NIL and its interplay with um, Title IX and, um, and the University Athletic Association? Sure. First, if the school is going to be involved in any way in NIL activity, it needs to make sure it has a plan in place to, to comply with Title IX to make sure that men and women get equal treatment and equal benefits throughout the NIL program. Um, it, it should check with its own counsel, it should hire outside counsel, um, whether it's, it could, it could hire my firm, not that we've ever done it, but we know how to do it. Um, it could hire any number of lawyers, but uh, it needs to make sure it's complying with the law in terms of the design of the program. But it also needs to make sure, second, that actually in implementing whatever it does, that it is providing equal benefits and treatment to the women and the men. Uh, to be clear, under Title IX, the fact that private donors are providing some money versus university directly other money doesn't matter. Title IX says we look at what the student athletes get, um, period. As long as the school is involved, the school has to make sure they're equal. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time today, Arthur. Again, um, my name is Blake Ledbetter. I'm the CFO of uh, Name Image uh, Sports Agency, and I thank you for watching our video today.